Welcome to Philosophy of Value Workshops number 19 of series 7. The question for today is, what is the scope of the relation between value states and cognitive frameworks? Uh, the reading for those who want it from one of my works, The Pursuit of Value, Chapter 7, Section 1. So in these workshops, we are examining human consciousness and analysing its problems in terms of value. My response to these problems is an affirmation of value leading to a certain sufficiency of value. One of the ways I qualify this kind of value is through relations with cognitive frameworks. Last week we discussed the nature of that relation with different kinds of cognitive relations and their objects. These involved co cognitive frameworks such as religion, ethics and the effect of other people. But the relation between cognition and value states is much more complex than I had time to explore. That is, even though I illustrated it with Bataille's metaphor of water, externalism and phenomenology. It is this depth complexity and scope of relations that I want to discuss today. But I not only want to discuss the relation between cognition and value, but also the relation between cognition and states of sufficient value. With respect to the scope of these relations, we noted that practically every human activity involves such relations and their significance derives partly from the fact that cognition and value are basic constituents of consciousness. That is, cognition is an essential property of consciousness and likewise consciousness brings value into existence and are coexistent with each other. So I've argued for these positions elsewhere. We can begin with the standard classification in analytic philosophy of cognitive and non-cognitive mental states. But this classification expresses a cognitivist bias and defines non-cognitive states ne negatively. It also neglects their mutual entanglement and presupposes a clear distinction from each other. So I supplement this classification with the four categories of cognition, affect, will and value. But only the categories of cognition and value are relevant in this discussion. Yet last week we distinguished two modes of cognition. These were analytic or logical and phenomenological or immediate modes of cognition. Again, in this discussion, only the immediate mode of cognition and its relation to value are relevant. That is, we're talking about the support that cognitive frameworks gives to certain value states. And to repeat, almost every human experience involves this relation between cognitive frameworks and value states. Last week, I gave the example of a child playing with a toy evoking states of wonder. And for adults, it could be a new car, a suit of clothes, or a new idea or invention. To illustrate the dependence of value states on cognition, my usual examples are those of religion and that of a child. That is, it's normal for a five-year-old to constantly seek parental approval, but it's pathological for a 25 year old to do the same. A similar comparison is often made to religion in seeking approval from divine authority. Yet the point above is about the cognitive support of value states and an implied preference for independence. And that independence is a sufficiency of value expressed in such forms as self-worth and self-esteem. The cognitive-non-cognitive -cognitive debate 
is about how to explain activities like moles, meaning and motivation. Yet in this debate, cognition is invariably used in the analytic sense, not the phenomenological sense. In this debate, cognitive theories are said to be impotent and, and unable to motivate action or morals. And non-cognitive theories are said to be blind and unable to guide action. One leading question here is, do we eat an apple because we desire it, or just because we see an apple? In this case, non-cognitivist motivation from desire is intuitively compelling. But moral motivation is more complex and difficult to ascertain. And cognitive and non-cognitive states are also used in different theories of explanation in different ways. This was illustrated last week with the different logical or supportive functions of cognition. Mutual entanglement and indistinct boundaries between cognition and non-cognition adds complexity to this picture. Yet cognitivists like Kant explain morals and motivation primarily in terms of reason and certain conceptions of things. Hume represents the non-cognitivist view which seeks explanations primarily in terms of affect and feeling. Kant thereby holds that we ought to follow the moral, the moral law just because we understand that the law is right. Yet this view can also include conferring dignity to those who respect what is right. But it's questionable whether dignity ought to arise just from respecting what is right. Yet on Hume's view, this still looks wrong, and moreover, the law might be wrong. But truth does seem to have inescapable claims on us which supports the cognitivist view. That is, truth is a mode of cognition which might necessarily evoke certain values. This is an interesting issue that I discussed two weeks ago and can't discuss it again now. I'll raise it to extend the discussion on the relation between cognition and value. But both these cognitivist and non-cognitivist theories are simplified accounts of human motivation. Nietzsche held that the chain of reasons for action is so long and complex that it can never be unravelled. Similarly, the question of free will has sometimes evoked complexity in working out reason for action. For example, the question of free will has been posed by some theorists as a question of value, that is, in the form of why did you act, rather than what caused you to act. In my view, it becomes increasingly impossible to differentiate acts of will from neurological and other causes. And it isn't uncontroversial that there are increasing degrees of complexity within the mind. We are then drawn into identifying complex incipient causes with our own will, wants or values. And if we identify those causes as our own, then we are free when we act on them. The point here is though, the complexity of cognition in not resolving the question of free will. Other issues are raised by the cognitive non-cognitive debate, like in the context of meaning and purpose in life. With respect to cognition, we can say that meaning in life is susceptible to facts in my life. That is, to find my life's work is useless or my wife doesn't love me can drain my life of meaning. And such facts are immediate perceptions, not processes of logical reasoning. David Wiggins examines both cognitive and non-cognitive theories of meaning in the myth of Sisyphus. Wiggins finds that both cognitive and non-cognitive theories 
offer <coughs> inadequate accounts of meaning. Non-cognitive value-based theories are incoherent and don't offer sufficient engagement with reality. And cognitive theories can't be constructed that adequately account for the experience of meaning. Yet meaning and purpose can employ either the immediate cognition of meaning or the analytic cognition of purpose. Both, rind, both render a meaningful life worthwhile and valuable. Yet only the meaning found in immediate cognition changes our apprehension of the world. We can then, we can then <clears throat> apprehend the world with familiarity, warmth and affirmation. And we can compare this to Nietzsche's yea sayings and affirmations of the world. In this respect, we can also quote William Blake's famous verse. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Thomas Mann writes more um, explicitly about the relation between object and subject in their mingling and identification and the resultant insight into the mysterious unity of ego and actuality, destiny and character, doing and um, happening, and thus into the mystery of reality as, as an operation of the psyche." Unquote. These accounts by Wiggins, Nietzsche, Blake and Mann are extremely abbreviated snapshots of a much bigger picture but they point to the scope, complexity and subtlety of cognitive relations with meaning and value. Yet the pervasive and complex relations between value states and cognitive frameworks are also found in existentialism. Existentialism illustrates these, yet not without broaching the earlier noted value preferences. And existentialism <coughs> introduces for us the idea of abjuring cognition as reason. Existentialism has strong preferences for disregarding reason in favour of states like authenticity. Existential choice, for example, eschews cognition and reason for actions as inviting inauthenticity. This is because strong reasons for actions are thought to detract from the essential subjectivity of choice. Reasons for actions aren't <clears throat> abandoned though, but regarded as impediments to authentic choice. This isn't an aversion to reason, but a selective aversion to reasons for action. That is, there are choices that draw upon interior values rather than unavoidable reasons. For example, if offered a choice between paying $5 or $10 for the same item, the outcome is practically <clears throat> inevitable. But not all choices are like that, like choices of who to marry or what to dedicate your life to. These choices are not made by algorithm, they demand deeper consideration. Sartre's notion of a spirit of seriousness illustrates a preference for another kind of unsupported choice and action. The spirit of seriousness is to take subjective values as objective, to avoid freedom and responsibility. The seriousness is to say that certain values are objective and therefore we have no choice. But Sartre regards this inauthentic bad faith and hiding behind the idea of objectivity. Sartre takes the idea of inauthentic cognit cognitive support further when he speaks of refraining from <clears throat> appropriating things for their own sake and trying to realise the symbolic appropriation of being in itself. For Sartre the issue here is hiding being and the security of material objects, rather than engaging with 
human experience and values. The existentialist aversion to reasons for action can be better expressed as what I call attenuated cognition. Attenuated cognition is a refinement that accepts degrees of absence of cognition. This idea is rejected by analytic philosophy and postmodernism, but accepted by phenomenology. Husserl, for example, cites different degrees and modes of perception in the flesh, in memory, or in fantasy, etc. I previously outlined three applications of attenuated co cognition. One, that the mysteriousness of consciousness is due to a lack of or attenuated context or background. Two, that consciousness is inherently self-obfuscating because it can't compare itself to other <coughs> entities of the same kind. And three, that a certain sufficiency of value is indicated and induced by diminished cognitive frameworks. This aspect of value sufficiency is the, is the um, application of attenuated cognition most relevant here. This was <coughs> illustrated last week in Bataille's me metaphor of water in a bottle and Sartre's spirit of seriousness. Examples in life were given such as maturity, moral fortitude, <coughs> magnanimity and others. Firstly, the mysteriousness of consciousness and other objects is best explained by contrast to standard perception. Standard perception involves contrast and reference to a background of understanding like a white spot on a black board that can't be perceived as a black spot. But a limited context or background of understanding produces attenuated cognition. This mysteriousness of things as limited background or context has been noted by a number of thinkers. Freud, Russell and Wittgenstein, for example, described mysticism variously as a sense of oneness with the universe, interrelatedness, and feeling the world as a limited whole. Yet mysterious objects can be similarly explained like God, the universe, flying saucers, and the totality of things. Yet, interestingly, we can also explain the mysteriousness of consciousness as its self obfuscation that is, secondly, consciousness can't compare itself to other objects, other conscious beings of the same kind in the same way. That is, consciousness has immediate and first-person knowledge of its own existence, typified in the phrase, I think, therefore I am. But consciousness doesn't have this same immediate access to other conscious beings. Consciousness cannot therefore compare itself in this way, resulting in mysteriousness. And this mysteriousness can thereby be argued can thereby be um, arguably explained by attenuated cognition. Merleau Ponty similarly writes that it is of the essence of consciousness to forget its own phenomena. Husserl and Sartre have also noted the difficulty of apprehending consciousness. Yet thirdly, and more relevantly, attenuated cognition explains moral features such as, noted, such as the noted sufficiency of value. For example, moral fortitude is doing the right thing without social endorsement or cognitive support. And I gave the example of value sufficiency in different support needed by, 25, by 5 or 25 year olds. Attenuated cognition can also be seen in an absence of endorsement or in the cost or sacrifice of altruistic action. Kierkegaard had the extreme view that Christianity has cast out all self-referential self love. We also noted that existentialists relish 
inadequately informed choices as occasions of freedom and authenticity. Sartre's spirit of seriousness decries the support found in taking subjective values as objective. Elsewhere, Bernard Williams cites self-indulgence as a form of unwarranted cognitive support. But these are examples of attenuated cognition with less or excessive cognitive support, and they illustrate relations between cognition and value states. Last week I noted that other people are one of the most potent cognitive frameworks that support value states. This is especially the case of social structures which objectify and internalize the value of other people. We are continually involved with and need other people, reinforcing their significance and value. Spinoza held that the influence of other people on motivation and desire was inescapable. I moderate that view of inescapability with a dialectic outlined shortly. Yet other people are one of the most luminescent sources of value in our world. Social endorsement is one of the most potent forms of cognition as qualification by other people. Hence the power of fame, shame, social esteem, status, ostracization, stigma and saving face. Two of the strongest relations that we have with other people are moral relations and relations of love. And conceptions of other people, as well as the person loved, are especially significant in morality and love. That is, love is often thought to be both of great value and have a sufficiency in itself. For example, people in love often have little concern about what, the, what other people th think of them. Yet the relation between the lover and the beloved is particularly significant. When we are in love, it is assumed that we are in love with someone, and we invariably want our love to be reciprocated. But is it better to love without needing to be loved in return? And do we have to be in love with someone in order to be in love? These questions are about the quality and sufficiency of value states like love. And to what extent do these different value states require supporting cognitive conceptions? Of course, we usually have to be in love with someone in order to sustain that love. And that we not only have to be in love with someone, but with a certain conception of someone. They have to be the right gender, age, culture, and a number of other things to be Mr. or Mrs. Wright. This again <clears throat> illustrates the relation between the value state of love and cognitive frameworks. As noted earlier, meaning in life is also <clears throat> susceptible to facts in a variety of cognitive expressions. The above considerations are about the absence or attenuations of cognitive support. This can be illustrated again with an already noted cognitivist theory of meaning. On a cognitivist theory, meaning that derives from a certain conception of things, including the idea of a future. Yet we would want a, yet we would want a robust account of meaning to cope with the vicissitudes of life, including death. Cognitivists criticize the non-cognitive view for neglecting outcomes, but a cognitivist account can't guarantee benign outcomes. And worse, cognitivism relies on a conception of the future, which is denied by death. Of course, the above is a binary account but it sets the stage for questions about optimal degrees of cognitive support. And considerations of loss and death point us towards non-cognitivism as a certain sufficiency of value. 
To do this, we can restate the problem of death in terms of cognitivist and non-cognitivist perspectives. That is, we can say that the problem of death involves a loss of the future and a fear of not having a future. Yet cognitivist theories base meaning on certain conception of things like having a future. So a theory of meaning that can confront death requires us to draw on our own inner resources in the present. The position best able to do this is a non-cognitivist theory of the noted sufficiency of value. Sufficiencies of happiness or pleasure aren't able to offer the qualities of experience required. We've been talking about graduations of both attenuated cognition and value sufficiency and their relations. Cognitive frameworks support value states in the dynamic relation that we can describe as a dialectic. That is, people attain degrees of sufficiency or independence from cognition according to their capacities. Yet due to their will to value, these capacities can increase, enabling greater independence from cognition. Value sufficiency is also relative to individual circumstance and requirements. And this relativity means that value sufficiency is also insufficient in some way, and that this insufficiency implies a need for rectification as value sufficiency. Yet human beings are creatures that recognize their own finitude, inadequacy, and lack of value. And the recognition of a genuine absence or lack of value is one of the reasons to pursue further value. In this way, value sufficiency is also a lack of value that calls value to produce more value. Thereby, value itself has a proclivity to further value as the will to value. But there is a cognitivist challenge to taking these value states and choices to be about sufficiency of value. That is, are we really talking about the sufficiency of value states or underlying cognitive processes? This is also a challenge to the whole idea of cognition functioning as a structural support of value. Are we talking about the development of values, states and attitudes like, matur like maturity and resilience? Or, or, or is it just a change of beliefs about reasons not to get anxious or angry? A cognitivist account would hold that these are the same, that value development is just about better ideas. For example, resolving the problem and the fear of death is a matter of better beliefs rather than states of maturity. But states, of, but states like fear or equanimity do exist as experiences. They aren't just beliefs and they ex can be expected to have tangible effects. The difference between a five-year-old and a 25-year-old, for example, argue against the cognitivist account. Such increases in maturity are accompanied by increases in awareness and emotional capacity. To illustrate the scope and significance of this dialectic between cognition and value, I can show it as a process in time. To start with, William James first described mental processes as a stream of consciousness. Edmund Husserl also spoke of the flow of consciousness as a flow of becoming. And Martin Heidegger emphasized temporality and time as the horizon of being. Even Sartre wrote about the flux of consciousness. On this view, time is both a necessary precondition and an element of consciousness, cognition and value. Kant's Copernican revolution goes so far as to regard both space and time as, as produced by consciousness. That is, consciousness is moving through time as well as through diversity in space. 
and we find ourselves in a world of time or temporality as well as cognitive diversity and value choices. The diversity of the world demands selections and choices that produce value. Both cognitive judgments and values must be continually produced to cope with the flow of existence. On this view, time is just not the horizon of being as Heidegger presents it. Time is also the foundation and matrix of cognition, selection and value in which consciousness is produced. More than that, time is part of the fabric of consciousness as a process and relation with the world. These relations between time, consciousness, cognition and value further illustrate their scope and significance, that is mental states and significantly value states are in relations with cognitive frameworks in these different ways. In conclusion, I can review where we have got to in the relations between cognition and value. Last week we outlined two kinds of cognitive apprehension, analytic cognition of logic and reason and immediate affective or phenomenological cognition. That mode of cognition is employed in cognitive frameworks supporting value as above. Today I wanted to show the depth, complexity and scope of these relations. These are found again in practically every human activity, but they are more pronounced in ethics, aesthetics, meaning and relations with other people. And these activities reveal both the complexity and the subtlety of these relations. That is both value or value sufficiency and cognition are subject to graduation. As attenuated cognition, we found explanations of mysteriousness, self obfuscation and morality. In terms of value, graduation ranges from self-indulgence to moral fortitude and value sufficiency. And the tension between cognitive support and value sufficiency resulted in a dialectic. That is, a dialectic of an ever-increasing sufficiency and quality of value. The implication here is of a preference for value sufficiency and avoidance of excessive, excessive cognitive support. So the question for next week is about self-indulgence in relying on supportive cognitive frameworks. So let me have your comments or criticisms at the meeting or on the websites at zoom or meetup.com.